Uh, it's good to be here in Ethics Week. Uh, one thing Ken didn't uh, tell you is, what is this, the 11th year or something like that? And I think our 14th, and this is my fourth appearance either on a panel or a presentation, but this is new material and I know none of you are around for my uh, earlier ones. Uh, I'm glad you gave me the basketball uh, introduction. I've got the Mike Bray look here. Uh, I tried this joke yesterday and it fell flat, so I'm going to try it again today. Who, those, I assume some of you go to the men's basketball games. Who's been the surprise star of the last two games? Jack Cooley, okay? So my wife and I went to the uh, Louisville game a week ago. He scored 10 points, did very well. Thursday night, there wasn't much on TV, so I'm flipping the channels. Uh, she likes reading books, so I keep it on mute. But I went from uh, ESPN to TNT or uh, whoever had on the Celtics versus the Lakers game. And they panned the Celtics bench. And my wife sort of naively popped up and looked and said, well, that guy on the Celtics bench, he looks like Jack Cooley. And those of you who were around here last year, of course, that's uh, Luke Herringote, who everybody said Jack Cooley looked like last year, how quickly they forget. So uh, it's good to be with you. I'm going to do something as a marketing guy that uh, is a little different. I have PowerPoint slides, but I'm going to give you a handout. Since I saw I was here yesterday, people were furiously taking notes. So you can take a few notes on my PowerPoints. You know, uh, be able to figure out where I'm at in the process. Just keep passing them back if you would. I have about 50 copies. I hope I have enough. And if you want, if you don't get a copy and you want a copy, please see me uh, afterwards. So uh, we're going to talk about sustainable marketing today. And uh, yeah, it's got seats in the in the front. And my interest, uh, if any of you are here on Monday, my interest in the whole sustainability environmental area actually started in the 70s at Notre Dame. That was the first Earth Day, was my senior year at Notre Dame. And it had a major impact on me, so much so that I did my doctoral dissertation in the mid-1970s entitled An Investigation of the Effect of Ecological Information and Social Class on the Importance of Rating, Rank Ordering, and Brand Choice. So I'm not a Johnny-come-lately that uh, I'll pass it around if you want to see what a 100-page dissertation is fairly short by today's standards. But when you're going through that, think, the, think B rather than A. One, when you look at the date, you'll think, boy, is he old. But think B, he was way ahead of the curve in looking at sustainability, environmental issues in the 1970s. So we're going to talk about sustainability and what is that. Uh, most of you probably haven't had a course in it. And this Brundtland uh, Commission called Sustainable Development, Meeting the Needs of the Present Without Compromising the Ability of Future Generations to Meet Their Needs. So meeting the present while not compromising the future. On the introduction, uh, those of you that have studied ecology and environmental things, uh, one of the most significant events happened in the early 1960s. It was published a book called Silent Spring. Rachel Carson was the editor. And then in the 70s, in the marketing area, since I'm here talking about sustainable marketing, we had something called the societal marketing concept, which said we not only should satisfy consumers, which all of you have had principles of marketing or in principles of marketing, but also we should keep in mind the social and environmental impacts of products. And that's kind of what I've spent my career studying, the social, ethical, environmental impacts. And there was a part of the Journal of Marketing in 1971 uh, editorial, and I'll have to reach for my reading glasses here, just want to read you one sentence quote, the consumer citizen has made environmental concern one of the pressing social and political issues of our time. One current challenge is for the corporate citizen to understand, adapt, and contribute to environmental improvement. And I'm happy to say in 
2011, a lot more corporations were doing it than in 1971. And we'll talk about some specific examples as we go through here uh, today. The similarities and differences, uh, this is from a paper. In fact, this presentation is based on a paper that uh, I did a few years ago. If any of you are masochistic enough and want to see the paper, I'm happy to send it to you. All professors are uh, happy to share their work. But in the 70s and 80s, when we first started talking about environmental problems, pollution, ozone depletion, that uh, I don't know if any of you uh, have ever read this before, the water pollution was so bad in Cleveland, Ohio in the late 1960s that the Cuyahoga River caught fire. Now that's pretty tough, right, to have a river catching fire. But that's how polluted it was. So we have the EPA and air pollution, water pollution. Another one was uh, walking on the streets of New York was like uh, smoking 38 cigarettes a day. Okay? These were some of how foul the air and water, things that most of you in this room never had to deal with, but were issues in the 70s at least. Ozone depletion, that continues to be a problem. Population pressure, what do we have? Six billion people in the world. Where are we going to get the water? Where are we going to get the food to uh, be able to have them exist? Uh, now these, kind of the lower right here, globalization. In the 70s, we really didn't talk much about climate change and global warming, or some people call it greenhouse gas effect. And We've always lost habitat and species. I think the thing that's different now is that we're in such a connected world that we know about these species uh, that are being lost. And it is severe uh, with respect to what's happening uh, throughout the uh, world. The other thing, um, right, let's move on to the three R's to the four R's. And I want to have a little audience uh, participation here. What are the three R's dealing with the uh, environmental issues that uh, you heard from grade school on, probably? Reduce, reuse, recycle. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Very good. Jessica, he's your student. He gets an A for today. So, uh, uh, so reduce, decreasing the amount of waste, trying to be more efficient is important. Uh, one thing that came to mind that all of you are exposed to is now uh, water bottles, if you can find uh, bottled water, that uh, the package or container has a lot less plastic than it used to. So reducing the amount, but better off to do this. Okay? A lot of you carry your own container. I brought my uh, water uh, and a glass that I'm reusing. So reusing uh, and uh, Recycling, obviously important. We now have single stream recycling. We heard about Monday this week. One of the things the article brought the fourth R uh, mentioned in consumer electronics, only about 15% of cell phones, computers, other electronics, televisions are recycled. And I think that's something as a society we really need to work on. The fourth R is rethink. Rethink. Try to rethink the process. In other words, coming up with better, uh, more interchangeable components. I'll end my talk uh, uh, a little bit later with a, a company that's doing this rethinking in cell phones. We're trying to come up with better design or refurbishing older phones. Some of you are probably, how many of you are on your second uh, smartphone? Okay. So at least a third of the group. And there's a good part of not only the world, but uh, in the United States would probably be happy with that first generation smartphone. But how can we refurbish them, put them back into operation? I think that's a real challenge. And those of you as business students, I think a real uh, business opportunity. The uh, last point on the first uh, or second slide there is this uh, notion of consumers buying benefits. And look at just what I have highlight. This is from a book called The End of Oil. Customers don't want lumps of coal, raw kilowatt hours, barrels of sticky black glue. goo. What they want is the services energy provides. Hot showers, cold beer, mobility and comfort, spinning shaft, microchips, so on and so forth. 
So customers, you and I, do not necessarily want coal-fired power plants. We want to be able to turn our lights on. And there was a famous article written in the 60s by a marketing professor who said, people do not buy gasoline, they buy the right to drive their car. And we're now figuring that out, if you will, that uh, we have some new uh, products on the market that use little or no uh, gasoline, but it took us a long time to, to get there. But an important kind of marketing uh, point that uh, we should think in terms of the benefits rather than the products. The ethical bases for sustainable marketing, uh, several that uh, I outlined in this article. The first uh, called the precautionary principle as the name implies that if you think there's going to have negative impacts out there, what precautions should we take? When an activity raises a threat of harm to human health or the environment, precautionary measures should be taken. And the author who kind of proposed this said the Europeans are far further down the road than the Americans or US citizens because of population density. They can't kind of throw things away. It'll be in somebody's backyard. Be those of you who have traveled in Europe know that most of the countries are pretty densely populated. But in the United States, I think we have to think in terms of the precautionary principle. Okay? Uh, the second one there is the notion of balance. And, uh, in your ethics class, I don't know if you've talked about the ethic of the mean. Trying to find the middle ground balance is important. And uh, Professor Enderly, who's on our faculty, has written about that. Or the triple bottom line is another way to look at it. The notion of trying to balance environmental, social, and uh, economic uh, uh, issues. The power responsibility equilibrium as kind of the name implies, the most powerful companies or organizations should accept the greatest amount of responsibility. Companies like uh, General Electric. I'm embarrassed to say in my article that was written five years ago, I used BP as an example. Well, we strike that one out and, uh, after what happened in the summer of 2010, but five years ago they were uh, doing some positive things. But they've obviously lost power because of that issue. So the power responsibility uh, equilibrium, the environment as stakeholder, usually th we think of stakeholders as being groups of people, customers, employees, stockholders, but is the environment itself or is the environment a surrogate for future generations? So that uh, we kind of use the environment as a, a surrogate measure there. And uh, one company that uh, I have a lot of respect for is called the Cooperative Bank from England, lists seven stakeholders and one is the National International Society that includes the natural world and the six billion people who inhabit it. So that's uh, the way they put it. The planetary ethics is not kind of otherworldly ethics, but rather to keep our uh, eyes focused on the people throughout the planet, and I'll have some things to say about that uh, a little bit later. The last one is stewardship, and I didn't talk about this in the article, but in uh, recent years, the Catholic social thought has had a big emphasis on stewardship. In fact, the whole environment is a, a takeoff on that, and the Pope's latest encyclical has a paragraph on what's called uh, responsible stewardship over nature. So that's uh, an important uh, aspect there. All right, so that's, there are other uh, uh, ethical uh, issues and ethical uh, theories, but we'll stop at those. Let's look at this uh, definition of sustainable marketing, those of you that have copies in front of you. Uh, just take, uh, few seconds there to read over it. Tell me what uh, a significant phrase or word or group of words that uh, jump out at you from this. First definition as shows in the bottom is a, from a European source and the next one we're going to talk about is from an American source. So what uh, if you had to say, boy this, this really 
it's something that I am, uh, think is important. Not everybody at once here. We'll get us started. All right, wearing his Notre Dame hockey. Uh, okay, so take it away. You got called out there. Tim. All right, uh, the show bottom line concept kind of stuck out to me where it's not only saying we need to do something, but how do we do it? You yeah. create, um, produce, and deliver. Yeah, it's okay. It's not just something needs to be on how do we do it. Okay, right, so triple bottom line. Uh, I hope this isn't the first time that you've heard that uh, phrase, triple bottom line, but social, economic, and environmental issues. And as you say, they want to create, produce, and deliver solutions. That's back to my consumers buy benefits, they buy solutions rather than products. What else? That's one, certainly an important point there. A couple more. We're it's not going to be a quizorama, but. Uh, the guy over here is the former president of the LeBron James uh, fan club. James is from Cleveland. He probably was walking over the Cuyahoga River when he went to fire. <laughs> or your parents were. Is that you? Yes. Okay. And you don't have a copy here, so I'll help you out because uh, he doesn't have a handout. But. Uh, <laughs> It's interesting, in the definition of sustainable marketing, sustainable or sustainability shows up three times. So it's kind of like they're beating you over the head with that term. Also, the beginning, have any of you talked about uh, sustainable marketing, the next natural step? So that's kind of a play on words, if you will, natural step. But in addition to that, there's a whole process. If you Googled natural step, there's a process associated with this that uh, I think originated in Europe but has caught fi uh, fire in the United States so that the natural step means several different things. Okay, one last comment on this and then we're moving on and somebody have, have, their, have their hand up, uh, not that Professor uh, Milani's calling out of the front row. So who do we have to satisfy here at the end of this uh, Yeah. Kind of shareholders. That's right. So it says it's a sustainable marketing definition, not a finance definition. So in a sustainable marketing definition, we have customers, important stakeholder, and other stakeholders, which shareholders would be one of them, but certainly the environment uh, uh, would be another stakeholder. So both satisfying customers, other stakeholders. So how's the American definition different. They both said it's a process, uh, but looking at the middle definition there, it was one of the very earliest books written on sustainable marketing about uh, 15 years ago in the United States here. How is this definition different from the one before? Or what kind of jumps out you, at you from this definition? Yeah. Yeah. So their customer needs are met, that's their number one goal, whereas um, for the European one, it seems like they're delivering sustainable solutions while continuously satisfying customers and other stakeholders. Right. So if you look at that, that ecosystems or the environment comes in at the very end, where in the European one, it kind of pervades it throughout and uh, talks about, you know, satisfying customers and doing these other things. And uh, those... Who is in uh, principles of marketing right now? Nobody's a uh, few people that are. In that course, we, you probably have been talking about a managerial approach to marketing. And this is a very managerially oriented definition. Process of planning, implementing, and controlling. Uh, mentions the four Ps there, so on and so forth. So very uh, managerial and uh, kind of looking at it, and I've looked at it several other times, but for today, it's almost formulaic. You know, it's like this is the formula. Stick this in and then sustainable marketing will come out the back end. And it's not that simple as we all know. 
So enough on uh, definitions, but let's uh, talk about these four P's that those of you that are taking marketing probably uh, heard about. And uh, start with the product area, and maybe I'll see if I can get this. Was the so this was in a Wall Street Journal about a year and a half ago, and this talks about the carbon footprint of six products. A fleece jacket, 66 pounds, laundry detergent, 31 pounds, a boot, 121 pounds, milk, uh, 7.2 pounds, even the Prius, who's supposed to be one of the most environmentally sensitive cars, still 97,000 pounds. And I don't know about you, but one of my favorite brands of beer, Fat Tire, uh, is only seven pounds. The moral story is, drink milk or beer or uh, both, all of the above. But the point is that a lot of products we buy have a carbon uh, footprint and uh, I covered this up. Everybody's talking about it, what exactly is a carbon footprint and how is it calculated? So that uh, one of the things we're trying to do in, in marketing is raise people's consciousness uh, of that. And here's a company that uh, most of you are familiar with, or all you're familiar with, is uh, Timberland. But they have, and I'll blow this up just a little bit more, they have come out in their package with a, our footprint, climate impact, chemicals used, resource consumption, trees planted, 600,000. One of my MBA students said he saw a forest in the uh, country of Lebanon that had a posting on it saying that Timberland had uh, uh, purchased these. And Timberland is one of those companies that's known as a very uh, responsible marketer. Other sustainable products that uh, recently been introduced, the Chevrolet Volt, the electric car, if you will, or the Nissan Leaf. Have you seen that commercial with the polar bear? If you haven't, go to YouTube. You can even see how they filmed the, the commercial. Uh, Things like the compact uh, fluorescent light bulbs. Another company that's known for its environmentally friendly products is called Seventh Generation. And I know Ethics Week ends Thursday, but this Friday, the founder of Seventh Generation is speaking up in the Jordan Auditorium. Uh, his name is Jeff Hollander, and I think will give a very good uh, lecture that they make, I was just gonna tell you, a uh, complete line of non-toxic household products, 100% uh, recycled paper towels, facial tissues, phosphate-free cleaning, other cleaning supplies, chlorine-free chlorine diapers, and so on. At even the name of their company is called Seventh Generation. The company derives its name from the great law of the Iroquois that states, in every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. So you're talking about environmental sensitivity and future generations. Here's a company that's corporate name, if you will, is based on future generations. Uh, package reduction, I'll take this off and we'll move on. Another product thing is trying to reduce the environmental impact of the package. What's the most perfect package in the world from an environmental standpoint? Somebody said in the class the other day, banana, which is pretty good. You only have the peel, but it's even better than a banana. Any, anybody want to guess? Something everybody in this room has consumed. Well, you still have the outer edge. Ice cream cone. You eat the package. Okay, so there's nothing left. In an ideal environmental world, uh, that would be the way we would come up with it ecologically. We know that's not realistic. What's happened in the consumer world in recent years, I know some of you live in apartments or you see the uh, laundry detergent in your mother's uh, uh, laundry room. What's happened in the last several years is the 
package size of all laundry detergents has shrunk. We, ha we now have concentrated laundry detergent, and that was basically Walmart telling Procter & Gamble and telling uh, Unilever and other manufacturers, take out the water, make it more concentrated, takes uh, less shelf space, less uh, problem with uh, you know, using, back to the uh, reduce, reducing the amount of plastic used to package them. So a good example of package reduction. There are others uh, out there, but that I think is a good illustration. Uh, we talked about the labeling of timberland, and also there's a lot of these environmental seals out there, and the bad thing is that several of these environmental seals have uh, kind of been easy to get a hold of. This is something I was going to talk about a little bit later, but now it says certified green, environmental, uh, environmentally conscious, but this publication said we bought this certification for $15. So that's part of the problem we have in environmental labels now that people can literally buy them off the web, and I'll mention that in a few minutes. The Federal Trade Commission is looking in uh, to these labels, but there's over uh, 350 seals used worldwide, and uh, consequently, people are really confused about that. The last point here before we move to the next uh, uh, page is the shift to services. Ideally, we should make less pro products and move to more service or service-oriented economy. We have one good illustration that just started on campus uh, this year. That was the zip car concept. Okay? Does everybody know what we're talking about in the zip car? You rent it by the hour. Instead of having your car, uh, you can rent it by the hour, go to Martin's or go to Walmart, go wherever, and come back. So that uh, uh, it's been very successful in big cities. A lot of people, a friend of mine lives here in South Bend. Uh, his son lives in Chicago, and he said, Dad, I don't need my car anymore. And he's 20-something years old. He said, it's an impediment. Uh, but he uses Zipcar occasionally. So rather than having products, having services, another good illustration is the notion of cloud computing. Instead of having a bunch of servers on this campus or in a corporation, as least as I understand it as a non-technical person, they're not literally on the cloud, but they're out there and then people can tap into the system. So that uh, trying to have more services and less physical products uh, is extremely important. Okay, so that's the, the product P. So let's move on to the P of price, if you will. Are we doing it? So we should have a, from an environmental standpoint, a broader view of price, rather than having price narrowly defined as just dollars and cents, we need this broader view taking into consideration the social and environmental costs, uh, unfortunately like the disposal cost of virtually no product is included other than uh, the ones we'll talk about in a few minutes uh, were states have these bottle bills. And the consumer cost does not really take into consideration the disposal. Back when I was first doing research in this, uh, and Ken mentioned uh, Bradley, I actually did my master's thesis on recycled newsprint uh, back at Bradley many years ago. But when I was doing reading there or, uh, down in Houston, they talked about in the 70s having a disposal fee on every new car that was purchased. Think about that for a minute. Instead of having all these junkyards, you might still have uh, junkyards, but if you had to pay a $100 disposal fee and pay that up front, that would help the market and be the kind of thing that consumers would pay at least some of the uh, disposal uh, costs. Now we, if the cars get old, we give them to Goodwill or we give them to, I gave one mine a couple years ago to the Center for Homeless. But the point is that consumers do not pay the total cost. The one other point there before looking at the base of the pyramid is the point on price disparity where up until I would say two or three years ago, if you wanted to buy the environmentally conscious product, it always cost more. 
Now there's enough research and development that you can go into stores and you can find seventh generation is really not that much more expensive than other brands. And Jeff Hollander will probably talk about that on Friday. And also, we need to think in terms of what's called life cycle costs. You all heard about the complex. Uh, compact fluorescent bulbs. I think don't all the dorms have them in there? You know, it takes a little while for them to warm up. How much, how many uh, incandescent bulbs supposedly would you have to buy to, to get the life of one of these new type of uh, light bulbs? I've heard the number like low end seven times or seven bulbs to the high end of 10 to a dozen, so that even though the incandescent bulb, which I believe is going to be phased out in the United States in 2012, so if you really like them, uh, find them on the stores, uh, sh uh, shelves of the stores. But the point is that we're going to be forced to do that, and some people are reluctant to pay the price uh, up front. Let's talk a little bit about the base of the pyramid, because I think that when we discuss the environment, we're often looking only at the developed world. I talked about Europe, a lot of American examples. Uh, who makes up the base of the pyramid? And hopefully this is not a term you've never heard before. How many of this is the first time you ever heard the base of the pyramid? Okay, then give me a definition, those of you that uh, didn't raise your hand. Can you help us out here? I haven't heard it. All right, you haven't heard it? What about you? I haven't heard it either. Okay, somebody help these young ladies out. We're in the number one rank business school and people don't know the base of the pyramid. Yes, sir. It's, yeah, the, the income pyramid, but we're talking at the bottom of the pyramid, if you will, the base. Yeah, the, if we looked at the income pyramid, or just think of it as a triangle is the e uh, easier way, and the base of that triangle, or base of that pyramid, is the one to two billion poorest people in the world, okay? Not anybody, or very few people live in the United States, but uh, in African nations and others. And this was a good article on the base of the pyramid, that we discussed in my sustainability class just a few weeks ago. And uh, let me just make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. In. So African huts far from the grid glow with renewable power. This talked about a woman in Africa who had a cell phone and she had a business that uh, was uh, cell phone related, but to recharge her cell phone, she had to ride two hours on a bus to go to a big city to plug it in to get it recharged. A Chinese company, uh, unfortunately not an American company, came up with this $80 solar you know, unit that she put in her house where she could charge her cell phone. And this photo is, it says, Sarah Rudo's children have improved their grades now that there's light to study by. Before, they only had kerosene power, or very candles, or dimly lit. And yes, the uh, sun has to shine for this solar unit to work, but as most of us know, uh, Africa gets uh, a lot of sun all the time. And these are the kind of things that, from the base of the pyramid and the environmental standpoint, that we need to look at these uh, people at the base pyramid as a market and also develop products that maybe we can, what's called leapfrog the technology. Instead of doing what China's doing right now and building all these coal-fired power plants, can we come up with renewable sources like wind energy or solar energy to help the lesser developed countries in Africa and so on? And this article is a, a very good illustration of that. And I think going forward, your generation uh, hopefully will be part of that solution. So we can talk more about that uh, later if you want. Sustainable uh, marketing practice in the channel of distribution or place and we mentioned this early, earlier, the power in the channel. 
who's the most powerful member in the channel of distribution now? Three guesses, the first two don't count. We looked at the retail world. Who's by far the biggest retailer in the world? It's another thing all Notre Dame students should know. They, they employ 500,000 more than the second largest company. Walmart, yes, thank you. Okay. Headquartered Bentonville, Arkansas. One of my sons works for General Mills and he's on the Walmart account and he's all excited about that because uh, it's kind of where the action is. Uh, would you believe that 28% of General Mills sales is to Walmart or through Walmart? So they are the big player, the most powerful member of the ch channel. And Walmart and other companies are looking at this uh, integrated supply chain. As you can tell from the dissertation and looking at my hair, I've been around a little while. And we didn't really talk, especially in marketing and business schools, up until about the last 10 years about integrated supply chain. And I think that's a very positive development that we're discussing it. And uh, an illustration I want to use is actually from Walmart and what they're doing with their supply chain. So Walmart has come up with a supplier sustainability assessment where they're forcing their suppliers, they're kind of phasing this in, they, aren't, uh, they haven't made it mandatory quite yet, but uh, they're telling their suppliers they have to look at a number of questions. And I'm going to put this next thing up, but kind of ignore the questions. And you can find this on Walmart's website. That's where I found it. And Walmart wants the suppliers to look at four areas, energy and climate, reducing energy costs, greenhouse gas emissions, material efficiency, reducing waste, enhancing quality, natural resources, high quality, responsibly sourced raw materials. Another article about Walmart that was uh, about a year ago was Walmart in India's buying locally grown fruits and vegetables. If you'd have told me even three or four years ago that was going to happen, I'd say uh, low probability. But that's part of what they're shooting for and other companies are doing as well. And then people and community, productive workplaces and communities. So that trying to get the supply chain members to answer these 15 questions and become more sustainable so Walmart can sell more sustainable uh, products. On the transportation, that uh, I'm sure you've all been on the Indiana toll road sometime in the last uh, year. And it seems like to me, every time I go on the toll road, there's more trucks on it. In the past, I used to say to my wife, well, let's travel on Sunday. There are less trucks on the road. Now, virtually every day, there are a lot of trucks. And the reason there are all those semi-trucks out there is they're transporting products from A to B. In fact, we had a speaker in that 10 years hence who said the average distance that many products that Americans buy is uh, travel a couple thousand miles or 1,500 miles. So that says you have to have a lot of these trucks, and trucks use diesel fuel, some of you use a lot of it, and if you knew me or were in other presentations, you'd know I'm not a Walmart shopper or a Walmart prom promoter, but here's another thing that Walmart did that was very simple about five years ago, because they also have the biggest fleet of trucks in the United States, and they said, how can we reduce fuel consumption? Does anybody know what they came up with? Very simple, simplistic thing. Okay. In trucks, you have a cab, and then you have a trailer, right? So the cab is lower than trailer. All they did was come up with that you know, kind of uh, thing that fits on top of the cab, so it reduces the friction, and the mileage went up. 10% or 15%, I didn't look it up, uh, but this is several years old, but it was like instant savings. We talk about low-hanging fruit for Walmart, that was low-hanging fruit. Another thing they did was change the idling mechanism when their drivers were sleeping, that uh, they would, the trucks would use less fuel than, um, than normally. So transportation, reverse channels of distribution. One thing I'd like you to take away from today, and I have, hopefully you take a lot of things away, but one thing is to think more about reverse channels of distribution. Instead of products all going out, can we get products back? Uh, 
maybe uh, somebody that lives in a state, either Michigan, Maine, or Oregon here, that has what we call a bottle bill, which is an illustration of a reverse channel of distribution. How does it work in those states? Yeah. There's a five cent tax on anything um, that is recyclable if it's a bottle. And uh, you take them to a bottle return place and you get a deposit back um, for giving them the bottle back. Okay. And what state are you from? Oregon. Oregon. And Oregon was the first. In fact, one of my first academic papers was a cost benefit analysis of the Oregon bottle bill. So in Oregon, they've had it since the 1970s. I think Michigan's had it since the 80s. Those of you that may traverse up to Michigan on a Sunday to buy some unsaid products, uh, if you're not paying uh, close attention, you're, buy, you're paying 10 cents in Michigan for every beverage container. And then if you take it back in Oregon, can you take it back to the supermarket or you have to take it to a recycling place? Only the supermarket. So where you buy it, take it back. In fact, on the news just a few days ago, there was a story of a Massachusetts retailer that was selling back uh, cans or selling cans in Maine who has one of these bottle bills. And basically, they were, uh, you know, uh, doing, taking invalid or uh, products that they shouldn't be doing and it was very much of a scam so unfortunately those things happen in reverse channels of distribution but we also know I mentioned the computer system some of the computer manufacturers are much better on getting things back or the toner printer cartridges now send you a, a envelope and you can send it back to them so thinking creatively about reverse channels the last uh, point there on the first line is promotion should be the last decision, and I hope I'm not contradicting anything that uh, your principles of marketing instructors are telling you, but you should have your product determined. You should decide whether you're gonna sell it at Walmart or you're gonna sell it online. You should have your price in place, if you will, then decide how to promote it, either advertising or selling. And uh, one of the terms in this, there are a lot of negative terms associated with marketing, but one of the negative terms associated with marketing with the sustainability area is called greenwashing. And there's a whole group out here that uh, in a Catholic institution, I thought you'd enjoy this uh, seven sins of greenwashing. So I'll just read the, the first, the sin of the hidden trade-off, okay? that paper, for example, is not necessarily environmentally preferable just because it comes from sustainably harvested forests. Sin of no proof, just complain, uh, contending we're biodegradable. The sin of vagueness, okay? All natural, green are good examples here. The sin of irrelevance, uh, CFC free uh, is a common example, but CFCs are banned by law, okay? There's a law against uh, uh, CFCs came from aerosol cans. Are any of you old enough, other than uh, those of us professors, aerosol uh, cans? Uh, sin of fibbing. I don't know why they don't use lying, but they, uh, the least frequent sin. And then the one they added, it used to be the six sins. The seventh sin is the sin of worshiping false labels. All those labels that you can buy out there on the internet and others that uh, this is one of the, the problems. And, and I'll leave that up, not trying to test your, uh, this isn't an eye test or anything, but you might want to look at it. Uh, in the point about recent emphasis is this group that did some research finds that of all advertising claims out there now, 9 to 10% deal with the environment, which I can tell you even five years ago was not the case, but in the late 2008, 9, 2010, now about 10% of all messages are what we call green messages. And then uh, speaking of green, the FTC's role there is that they came up with, in the 90s, what they called green guides, and then uh, just last year, they proposed new green guides, and I'll just read you the headline here uh, regarding the FTC's for those of you who don't know what the acronym stands for, Federal Trade Commission, they are the major regulator of marketing and advertising. But here's the headlines. Agency seeks to tighten rules for, quotes, 
green labeling, looking for substance of eco-friendly. So like yesterday, Bill Nichols talked about how we measure a lot of the impacts of environmental activities within marketing. I think we need to get away from the greenwashing and move to more substantive points regarding things that are uh, eco-friendly. So let's conclude by looking at two examples. Uh, does anybody know what product interface makes? Yes. Your feet are on it. Carpet tiles. Interface makes carpet tiles, and I'm sure they probably made these carpet tiles. Their former CEO, Ray Anderson, I won't call him a YouTube star, but you can watch Ray Anderson from three minutes to, you know, 80 minutes on his uh, views, and he came at this somewhat reluctantly, but he really got religion, changed the whole product line of uh, interface that the, many of their new products uh, have less glue, the material is more recyclable, they came up with this term called biomimicry that comes from biology. Uh, in pricing, what they've moved to, it's a reinforced point I made earlier, is what they call their evergreen program is leasing you the carpet rather than selling you the carpet. So they, Notre Dame has a 10-year lease or whatever, and if this carpet, the Giovannini Commons gets used a lot and uh, people wear it out in five years, they'll come in, take all this up, put new carpet down, but the good thing is they will dispose of it in a very responsible manner and recycle a lot of it. So that's a good example of you know, having a physical product but also uh, having the service and, and doing away with it in an environmentally positive way. The channels, uh, they have a, a sales force. Most of their independent salespeople drive Priuses. The one I like is their promotion, which I don't know if you talked about it, but uh, you probably remember your parents buying new carpet. And anytime you're thinking about buying new carpet, what do you bring home to look at? These carpet samples, even for these uh, carpet tiles like that are in this room. And several years ago, Interface said, we're getting out of the uh, sample business. And the reason they did it was they argued that just their company in one year had three and a half heights of the Empire State Building in carpet samples. So what they did is you had to have a computer, which I'm sure most of their buyers have, then you could have a virtual room and look at the orange carpet or the blue carpet, and I'm sure you could go into the store to look at it, but they, they got away from the carpet samples. Are they a perfect company on the successes and challenges? Obviously not, but they're one of the leaders and have been a leader for some time. Uh, the other uh, corporate example, and uh, I can't see uh, past the first row, but at least a couple or three people have Nike products on. And uh, Nike has a somewhat checkered past, if you've talked about them in other courses regarding their... Uh, they don't like to use the term sweatshops. They would say there are subcontractors around the world. But on sustainability, they've really improved and they've come up with this Nike considered design. And it creates, uh, just to read off their website, performance innovation products that minimize environmental impact while reducing waste throughout the design and development process using environmentally preferred materials and eliminating toxics. And their vision, which uh, they have here, which I think is obviously they have to deliver on this vision, but there are sub points that I think are good ones. So design for recycling. Bring the products back. There's your backward channel of distribution. Anybody here ever taken back a pair of Nike? I'm not sure Foot Locker or some of the retailers would take them back, but it uh, be interesting to know if there are uh, Nike, you know, dedicated stores. Waste cannot be, uh, that cannot be eliminated should be recycled, product re less reliant on oil and water, 
and their, one of their first tests was with the uh, Air Jordan shoe, and I read about Michael Jordan being very excited about that, and they have come up with an index tool to evaluate the footprint somewhat similar to Timberland that we talked about before, and they have several components that they're trying to uh, examine like Walmart and like the uh, Timberland, and these are the components. You don't have to read the uh, small print. Solvents, waste, materials, garment treatments, innovation. And why have you not heard about this before? Basically because Nike is going slow. They're such a visible marketer, consumer marketer out there. They want to get this Nike considered program right before they uh, roll it out. So they're looking at all these components. Eventually, they're going to come up with a rating that's based on, three guesses in the first two don't count, the Olympic medals, okay? Sort of like the lead, gold, silver, and bronze. I think the big question will, will be if they don't make the bronze category, is Nike going to you know, take that product out of their product line? But the point is they're working hard on this, and I think it's a good example of a, uh, Illust uh, example and illustration of a company that we know well who's really taken this to heart and you can read a lot more about it on their website. To conclude here and then I'd like to open up with, for some questions, a couple reasons for optimism, a couple reasons for pessimism. The optimism is that there's more public reporting of sustainability, that virtually all major corporations now have either what's called a CSR report or sustainability report regarding how much greenhouse gas they used la or emitted last year versus this year, and the metrics uh, we heard about from Bill Nichols. We also uh, have organizations like the Global Reporting Initiative, if you haven't heard of them, uh, obviously they're important. And this notion of eco-branding, I think once we get settled in on some legitimate ones, will help out. And in most of these illustrations of Timberland, Nike, and Walmart that I mentioned, they've also brought in their critics. They brought in other stakeholders to help them, environmental groups and social groups, to help them come up with uh, better products. So the communication is important. Uh, reasons for pessimism. I still think there's too much greenwashing in this greenwashing report that came out. They said like 95% of all of those 10% claims have some, at least one of the sins of greenwashing. So the marketers and their enthusiasm are still, I think, uh, going over the top a little bit. And uh, the second point is this notion of stewardship regarding the Catholic Church, I'd like to see it more as a corporate value. There are only a couple companies that say stewardship is a corporate value, and it's a uh, difficult process with trade-offs. As a person who grew up on a farm, and my brothers are still farmers, there's something about using the kernels of corn to make ethanol that I don't think is right. Okay? We need to come up with other biofuels, and I know there's a lot of research on that, but uh, as a point I made earlier, what happens after people consume the product, I think, is an important marketing challenge. And I've got one last uh, overhead that I was hoping to show you here, but uh, I can't put my hand. It's a company called TerraCycle. Does anybody, they basically take wrappers that from schools, they make umbrellas that have Chip Ahoy on them. They make bags with Capri Sun packages. They actually make fertilizer from, uh, uh, and put it in bottles that uh, have, uh, you know, soda bottles. But it's a fundraiser for a lot of schools. But basically, it's a term that we call upcycling rather than downcycling, making a product, a waste product, into something that people want to use. I, mean, I think we have a few minutes here for questions. I covered a lot of uh, material. My guess is at least a few of you thought, hey, I thought Professor Murphy would talk about X, but X hasn't come up. So let's have a question on, uh, on X here. Just a couple and then I'll let you go. Still have. Uh, 
Alan. part of their social fabric. And I think that corporations understand that workers or employees, like all of you in this room, want to feel good about the company they're working for. And that's one of the things, frankly, Walmart and Nike found out about themselves, that there was a lot of criticisms of the organization, and they said, we need to kind of get out in front of this. So I think that companies are viewing this as part of what they need to motivate their employees. They also see a market at the base of the pyramid or in the developed world. And we all know in some respects we're living on borrowed time. So can we come up with better products that still, in my class yesterday we talked about energy efficiency. Rather than conservation, can we just be more efficient in what uh, energy we use on this campus and elsewhere? And I think that uh, regarding social responsibility, my view is we should take out the social part of it. It's corporate responsibility. Some of it has to do with the environment. Some of it has to do with volunteerism. Some of it has to do with the products. But that's where I think the corporations are looking at it from an integrated standpoint as opposed to, oh, we do good and therefore people will feel good about us. Well, thanks for your attention and uh, appreciate it. Thank you.